We greet all of you tonight. We're thankful for your presence. Those that have been traveling, we're glad that you're back with us, safe and sound. We welcome those who have joined us on live stream. We consider this a great fellowship. Look forward to being able to see you face to face, many of you at the renewal. Tonight, this will be our 20th lesson in the book of Amos. We're commencing the fourth chapter. You've detected already that this is a potent word. This is not for babies yeah. or for the naive, to be sure. But we're learning about God here. This is, this is the same God that we serve, we're reading about here. We're learning through his judgment of the house of Israel that judgment does, in fact, begin with the house of God. And this judgment is driven by God's nature. This is what God's really like. What we're, what we're reading about, this is really what God is like. But judgment does not just begin at the house of God. Wherever sin abounds, the judgment becomes more severe, and we'll, we'll, be, we'll be exposed to that. To this point, Amos has prophesied against Damascus, Gaza, Tyrus, Edom, Ammon, Moab, and Judah. Oh, God bless that brother Amos. He was uh, not a seminary trained person. He was a shepherd and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. He wasn't a prophet and his father wasn't either. It just tells, shows you what God can do. Amen. Amen. I want to just take a minute, this is a rather elementary view, but I want to take a minute to accent that the more a people has been given, let me be more precise, the more that has been made accessible to them, what you've been given is strictly speaking not just what you see, it's what's within range, your range, you can get it, it's been given to you, it's in, in your city so to speak, it's in your place, whatever, whoever's been given a lot but they didn't use it, or they abused it, the judgment gets worse. Yeah. See, there have been people that have been given a lot that had never heard about it. They don't realize they've been given a lot. But they have. Yeah. They're going to be held accountable for it. Because if the truth of God's near you, it's your business to find it. Now, in the English Bible, there's a number of words spoken against these groups. This is a very elementary view, but it will provide a perspective here. To Damascus, God directed 91 words in the English Bible. To Gaza, 88 words. To Tyrus, 52 words. To Edom, 63 words. To Ammon, 89 words. To Moab, 86 words. To Judah, 65 words. Now we're in Israel now. That's where Jerusalem was. Israel. To the present time, he's addressed 775 words to the pr at the present time. Where we are. That's not all, though. The Lord's diatribe against, against Israel continues from 4.4, 4, chapter 4, verse 4, after our, this text, uninterrupted till 6, chapter and the 14th verse. Then it continues in chapter 7, verses 8 and 9, 
Then chapter 7, 17 through 8, 14, it continues. Then chapter 9, verse 7 through 9, verse 10, it continues. 2,070 words after this. Remember, none of the others were anywhere near 100. Yeah. All total, the word count against Israel is 2,845. So we see judgment did not just begin at Israel. It was more extensive and more detailed. Now that's a kind of a kindergarten view, but you should get an idea there. God doesn't talk a little bit to people that need a lot of talk. And when God has poured out something, he just doesn't say, God bless you and goodbye. He goes into detail. In fact, he searches people this way. When he searches your heart, if you've been given a lot, be prepared for a big search, an in-depth search. That is given a lot. Remember, I'm saying who was, it was brought to you. You could have had it whether you went after it or not. You're responsible for it. That's a, that's a kingdom principle. Listen, brethren, a lot of people don't know this. I can tell you most people live in this city do not know that. Because they're not beating the path to find out what God has said. They're not, they're not probing into it, which means they don't, they don't know this is, the way, this is the way God is. Why do you suppose he judged Jerusalem? They received the acme of revelation. A son of God came there. See, the more is placed within your reach, and the more responsible you become. Damascus received 3% of the number of words that Israel received. And Tyrus and Gaza received 2.3%, Tyrus 1.8%, Edom 2.2%, Ammon 3.1%, Moab 3%, and Judah 2.2%. But it was weighty, that, that, that little percentage they had was very weighty. Now when we come to Israel, what virtually the rest of the book is about them. This confirms that all sin is not viewed the same. Yeah. Now there are unlearned people, unfortunately, some of them are teachers, some of them are preachers, some of them are professors, some of them are college presidents, some of them are some kind of Christian leaders, and they are teaching people that sin has, is not distinguished, distinguished by higher or lower depths. It is all the same. It doesn't make any difference if you overeat or commit adultery. It's the same, same weight. Now, that very thing is taught by a lot of people. That, that very that I just said, it may sound absurd, but a lot, a lot of people have been taught that. There's a sense in which the sin of sinners is not viewed the same. And Amos is living this out for us. All people are not loved the same. And those who say they are, are either ignorant or they're liars. There aren't any other alternatives. We've got specific statements from God it said to Israel, I loved you above all people on the face of the earth. Yeah. Now, how you could say of that God that he loves everybody the same, this is a, mis this is a misrepresentation of God, and if it's pressed, it's the proclamation of another God. Yeah, <laughs> yes. I see that almost as if the Lord demonstrated this in in the world we are living in, that the relationships we have that the Lord has given us, such as our masters or our family, they're not all the same. We don't look at all of them as the same. We don't yeah. love them all the same. There's a different kind of love for each of them. That's yep. right. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. That's exactly right. Some people get upset with me. It's actually more than me, but I'll, I'll take it to myself. Because I talk what they think an inordinately, inordinate amount 
on the faults of the church. They don't like that. They say it as being judgmental and we shouldn't do it. But see, they just don't know what they're talking about. They have not obviously seriously read the scriptures because this is what the prophets did. This is almost their total ministry, was pointing out the flaws in Israel. This is what Jesus, when Jesus came, ho oh, oh, if you know anything about what Jesus said, he pointed out the flaws of the contemporary Jews. And the apostles, when they found something in the church, they pointed it out. Amen. Boy, they'd be busy today. Yes. Moses spoke to Israel of its sins, the prophets did. John the Baptist did, Jesus did, apostles did. We must learn that God will not overlook those who mishandle the truth or who misrepresent them. He will not just like gloss over it. Men do. Men just gloss over it. Say, oh, well, they, they mean well. I'm saying I question it. I challenge that they mean well. I challenge a person to step forward and prove that people are speaking something that's not true, are sincere. I'm saying I don't believe that. I'm saying that if a person's sincere, God won't let lies come out of their mouth. Amen. That's the whole issue is they aren't. That's the whole issue. That's why they speak things that aren't true. Of course, that's what God brought against Israel. They weren't sincere. Now our text is the first three verses of chapter 4. Hear this word, ye kine, that's a heifer or female cow. Hear this word, ye kine of Bashan, that are in the mountain of Samaria, which oppress the poor, which crush the needy, which say to their masters, come and let us drink. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness that, lo, the days shall come upon you, that he will take you away with hooks and your posterity with fish hooks, and ye shall go out at the breaches, every cow at that which it is before her, and ye shall be cast into the palace, saith the Lord. <laughs> Even if you don't know what that means, it doesn't sound good. In this text, we're witnessing a God who was provoked. Can God be provoked? Yes, God can be provoked. I give you some text here which says, Israel provoked God. And Paul said to the church of Corinth, do we provoke the Lord? Are we, are we greater than he? Do you think you can agitate God and get by with it? He said, do you? <laughs> After all that's in the Bible about this, people still insist on saying that God is like Mamby Pamby, that he isn't irritated, isn't provoked, he just glosses over everything. In spite of all the records, we got Adam and Eve at the forefront, and we got the flood, and we got Sodom and Gomorrah, and we got Israel being kicked out of Canaan, we got the Babylonian captivity. We, you've got all these examples that when God was provoked, he did something. Now, he, he was long-suffering. He doesn't get, like, provoked instantly. But he, he can be provoked, and we are, we are being exposed to a provoked God. Now, he says, hear this word. In other words, say, listen, listen to this message. Listen to me. Give ear. A word isn't like a word is one single word. Here word means a message. Like the word of the gospel is the message of the gospel. It's a body of truth that's articulated. It's a point that's being made. It's something being made known. Get the message. Get what I'm saying. See, that's hear this word. Know what I'm talking about. Don't be in the dark about what I'm saying. And it sounds a little vague. As you read my cows of Bashan. Sounds a little vague. But he said, you better know what this means. If you can't figure it out, you make sure you figure it out. 
if Jesus says to his disciples, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, in view of the fact he never did tell them what he meant, they got to figure that out. And they did. While they were still in the boat, they figured it out. <laughs> See, he's talking about the doctrine of the Pharisees. They figured it out. Amen. See, don't be, a la don't be lazy intellectually. If you read something you don't understand, determine to understand it. Amen. Give ear to this word, this message. I'm saying this, I'm, I'm meaning to make a point here, God says. I'm just not talking. I'm speaking to you about something you need to hear that pertains to something you need to do that illuminates what you've done. Listen up now to what I'm, to what I'm saying. Jesus detected that the people didn't understand him, you know, when he was speaking. Even though some people say he talked so that so the child could understand. <laughs> yes. I'm, ashamed, I'm ashamed of Christians that say that. I'm ashamed of them. They're pathetic, pathetic representations of God. They were not, weren't picking up on what Jesus said. So here's what he said to them. He said, why, you do, you not, why do you not understand my speech? Why don't you understand what I'm saying? Even because you cannot hear my word. You don't have ears to hear. And the reason you don't have them is God didn't give them to you. So why don't people understand? Well, you've got it. You've got it here now from the mouth of Jesus. People don't understand because they can't hear. They don't have a spiritual aptitude to hear. All right, when he says, hear this word, I understand this to me that I'm giving, if you will pay attention, I'm giving with this word that's coming in capacity to hear. There's this aptitude to hear is coming with this word. Just like when the, Jesus spoke the word to the lame man, pick up your bed and walk, the power to do that went with that word. Amen. So the power to hear to, and to comprehend what God says, it comes along with the word. So that if you'll fasten your ears on it and listen to it, focus on it, it'll come to you, what he's talking about. Another time he likened a generation he was speaking to because they thought, they thought just the fact that they'd heard Jesus. Well, let's, let's make it contemporary. They thought just because they went to church and sat in church that that somehow covered up everything else. They just, but it didn't. If you didn't get it, you just sat in vain. You wasted your time and everybody else's. Here's what Jesus said to an audience like that. He said, some of them would begin to say, we have eaten and drunk in thy presence. And thou hast taught in our streets. You come to our synagogue, in our city. We heard, we heard Jesus. We heard Jesus. We were there at the temple when he spoke. We were there at the synagogue when he spoke. We were down at the seaside when he spoke. We well, he heard him. Boy, that makes us special. He said, but I tell you, the people are saying it, I tell you, I know you not. I know not from whence you are. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. So here are people that heard Jesus. To dumb it down a little bit, they went to church, and they went to Sunday school, and they read the literature, and they read the daily devotions. But they didn't profit from them. So God says, I don't know you. I won't recognize you. I don't like you. I don't want you around me. Depart from me. Le leave my presence. You want Jesus to say that to you? I know, I know you don't. If you do, we'd, we'd have to spend some time with you. Maybe have to send you to a ward or something like that. In our text, the Lord is admonishing people to hear what he's saying. Pay attention to it. Whatever you have to do to pay attention, you've got to cleanse. See, sometimes you have to cleanse your mind of other things. Amen. You've got competing thoughts. You're sitting there listening to the Word of God, but you've got all kind of everything. What am I going to have for dinner? Or what's the score of the next ball game going to be? And what a bunch of stuff going through your mind. You've got to learn to purge that stuff out. Amen. 
and to listen to what's being said. Right. <laughs> it's the particular message I'm delivering. Now listen how he addresses it. He's talking to Israel now. Ye kind of Bashan. Other versions say, you fat cows. This is God talking to you. You fat cows. You've been spending time in the pastures of Bashan, which is a very luxurious fields, a lot of foliage, a lot of rich soil. You fat cows. You've been up there in Bashan. You've been eating to the full. You get put on a lot. You're pretty beefy cattle. You're a bunch of fat cows. This is God talking. <laughs> It's a sad day when those created in the image of God are called fat cows. I say fat because they were in the uh, pasture lands of Bashan, which were especially rich, that, so they were obviously like, had, they gained a lot of weight. You remember that uh, Jesus sometimes, he likened people to animals. He'd say to Herod, tell that fox, he's a fox. Wasn't the last fox, I might add. John the Baptist, he called a generation of Pharisees and Sadducees a generation of vipers. Zophar referred to men as born like a wild ass's colt, kicking and a bucking all the time. Isaiah said Israel was like a wild bull in a net. <laughs> kicking and storming around after he's been caught. Jose referred to them as a wild ass alone jumping up and down out in the field like he's all by himself. Hosea also referred to them as a backsliding heifer. You see how the disgrace it is when someone made in the image of God is referred to like in beastly terms? Yeah. The word kind means heifer or female cow, as I've said. Some versions say fat cows because, as I've mentioned, they, they were feeding in rich pastures. The idea is people were living in the lap of luxury, fattening their coffers with their religion. That's what he told them before earlier. You remember those texts, don't you? He told them before. They were taking from the people, and by religion, they were getting wealthy and rich. Uh, sound familiar? Did anyone recognize that this, this is rather common practice today? These people are fat cows, in God's own words. What are you doing, you, you fat cows of Bashan? Well, you oppress the poor. Now, God has a special mind for the poor. He thinks they're the poor. A body of people that... These Israel were a body of people that could have ministered to the poor. And the law required that they do. The law under which they operated required them to take care of the poor, minister to the poor, among them. During the land Sabbaths, they were to, whatever grew in the land, on the land of its own accord, that was to be kept for the poor. That people couldn't go read it. Keep it, leave it for the poor. When they reap, they would leave the corners of their field. They would plow their field like if their field was a rectangle, they had plow in an oval and leave the corners. The poor would come in. When they gathered their grapes, he said, don't take every grape. Don't take every grape. Leave the grapes for the poor, for them to come. And they were told, open your hands wide to the poor. I mean... Don't give a nickel. Oh. Well, see, this is the law. The law told them to do this. But they ignored the law, and instead they, they hoarded their religion, enabled them to hoard for themselves. And as a result, they neglected the poor. Instead of relieving them, like the law said, they oppressed them. Now, James said the same thing was happening in the church. James, the fifth chapter. First five verses. There were some Christian, for want of another term, businessmen, who because the people were Christians, they were paying them low wages. 
Of course, this never happens today. I understand. <laughs> it's almost pathetic. The lowest paid teachers in the world are Christian school teachers. Huh? You say, well, they can't afford it. Then they shouldn't have a school. I'm telling you the truth now. James told the wages, he said, you've robbed the people of their wages and their cries, you've been convenient to them, their cries come up into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. God's heard these people. They don't have enough. They're not getting enough. They're working day and night and they don't get enough. And you've oppressed the poor. That happened in the church age. James 5, 1 through 5. Yes. The poor has become a, a complicated thing in our day, and it shouldn't be. It, for, the, for the Lord to say those things about the poor, about leaving the corners of your field and opening mm -hmm. your hand wide, first off, he's uh, under the economy of Israel. The poor were not a people that decided they didn't want to do anything, that they That's just right. wanted someone else to take care of them. There was there were reasons beyond <laughs> their control yeah. where the ability to gather wealth was out of their reach. Mm -hmm. And this this uh, taking care of the poor incorporated the idea that that Israel were one people under God. Mm -hmm. And so that God was taking care of the poor through the other people, but they were all That's his right. people. That's right. So when you looked at the poor, you were still looking at your brethren. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that's the setup. Now we have, in the church, of course we have a lot of heathen that are not, you know, part of the church. Mm -hmm. But it's gotten to the point where the church has, the church used to, but was unwise in making distributions to the poor. And now we've gotten to the point to where government has, is taking that away from the church. Mm -hmm. And the church really is suffering for, uh, for it in a way. It takes wisdom as well as generosity oh, yes. to yeah. really do good to someone else. Mm -hmm. And the point was to do them good, not mm -hmm. just to take care of them like pets. Yeah. Amen. Mm -hmm. yeah, this, uh, it may sound a little crude, but this is the way it was. There's no reference in Scripture of the of people that were with the Lord feeling obligated to feed the poor of the world. Now, I'm not saying that that's wrong. I'm just saying this is this isn't the way the church operated. When they cared for the widows, it was the widows of the church. Acts five. When they sent collection to the poor saints, to Jerusalem, and I'm, all Judea was in a famine. But they sent the collection to the poor saints. That, shall we say, is the first, the first obligation. It's up to you what you do with the rest. That's the first obligation, yes. Jesus did say, whatsoever you shall do to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it That's unto right. me. Mm -hmm. So for Trey's, I brought this out before, but the outward appearance has nothing to do with the spiritual state of a person. Lazarus and the rich man, the parable that Jesus told illustrates this perfectly. Mm -hmm. Lazarus was the beggar. His sores were licked by the dogs. His state was miserable in this earth. The rich man was exactly the opposite. He always had whatever he needed when he wanted it. But those two states were reversed when things were revealed and shown how they really were, and Lazarus was the one was the one who had eternal riches. Yeah. And they both were Jews. Yeah. Yeah. See, there are some people who say God has raised up the church to relieve the poor of the world. Well, again, I challenge somebody to prove that. Yeah. Don't just say it; prove it. That is not what God said. He's not saying don't help them. Don't get me wrong. But the obligation is toward his people. But you oppressed the poor. And you crushed the needy. 
Again, the law required the Israelites to open their hands of generosity to the needy. Deuteronomy 15 11. They were commanded not to oppress them. Deuteronomy 24 14. Don't oppress the needy. People that are in bad straits of some sort. Isaiah upbraided Israel for not granting just judgment to the needy. They had no advantage in the courts of their land. Yet Israel ignored these words and they crushed the needy. The needy, they were worse off when they came in contact with the Israelite, their own people, they were worse off. Yeah. Now these are the needy of Israel he's talking about. You crushed the needy. You broke them, you bruised them, you discouraged them. You gotta be able to apply this to today. Would say to their masters, bring and let us drink. In other versions call masters husbands. Kine I refer is a female. So they're saying it was women saying to their husbands, bring the drinks out. Come on, let's let's drink together. They were demanding satisfaction of personal needs while failing to meet the needs of the poor and needy. That's, that's the contrast that you have there. This is what Israel was like, indulgent and lazy women. That's what they were like. For them, the meaning, this word was either straighten this out or I'm going to come against you. The fact of this word is, I am coming against it because you didn't. Sitting in the lamp of luxury, they thought themselves, let's just have more luxury. Let's just sit here and drink. Bring the drink in. We are going to go get it. Just bring it in here. Yes. Yeah, this was, and again, we can, we can examine ourselves in the same manner. But it was wrong because it offended the justness and the righteousness of God. This is not what God does. Mm -hmm. And as the people of God in name, they represented God to the world. Yes. It's kind of like whenever David sinned and he brought reproach on the name of God before the heathen. And so God judged him mm -hmm. very publicly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's to repudiate, I am not that kind of God. And whenever this is this is serious because they're bearing the name of God. Amen. And they're a personal offense because what they are is unrighteous, and that offends God. Yeah. And then they're bringing reproach upon the name of God because of their because of the the relation of them to God in the minds of the of the world. Yeah. One night, a, a couple of uh, examples of this. One is our missionaries and some ministers that are they're actually poor, very poor, barely making it along. And so somebody sends them like five dollars or some used clothes. Or as one church did, they're used CT bags. Yeah. Personal experience that I have with that. They made their, in other words, they made the situation of these laborers worse when they should have made it better. Well, and early on, the Lord was teaching Israel that all their resources were from Him mm -hmm. and to be used for Him right, and right. to reflect Him. Everything from their income to what they grew to what they wore. And so, and then even in their sacrifices, there were things that were then for the Levites also Amen. to partake of as, as they were ministering. So to take, anytime we start looking at what, we, what we've been given as somehow truly being ours, it belongs to me, yeah. and not committing it to the Lord, yeah. I think that's one of the, the core sins of this is that these were people that belonged to the Lord. This was something the Lord desired. If you look at Jubilee, that was a reminder that everything belongs to the Lord. Yeah. Now you forgive all debts. Why? Mm -hmm. Because the Lord, That's right. all these Amen. things belong to the Lord. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a, a stewardship in that in everything that we have, we want 
to give it to God for His use. Amen. Whenever we depart from that, we fall into a pitfall. Then. Amen. And this is a matter of trust. Yeah. It is. As a person that that has a lot, or seems to have a lot, or comparatively has a lot, it requires that they trust God to for for their own sustenance instead of worrying about. Well, what if I get depleted? Whenever they know this is something God wants them to do. Right. Now, you take the tithe. Boy, people, they get right up in arms. You start talking about a tithe. Well, boo-hoo. God talked about it. Yeah. And that everybody stands or falls before their own master. I can only speak for myself. But whenever God said, the tithe is mine. I don't feel at liberty to say, well, not my tithe. <laughs> because he gave it all into my hand. Yeah. And I don't want to be found an unfaithful steward. I've got to trust God that the 90%, that is, you know, if you want to give more, fine. But the minimum of 90% that he let me keep that he's going to bless that and it'll meet whatever needs I have. Amen. When you give to the poor, you got to see this as the hand of God working through you. And you've got to trust that the God that gave it to you initially will sustain you too. Amen. Yeah, God could have demanded 90% and gave you 10%. Yeah, that's right. Then he could have made it work if you'd have done it. Yeah, it's right. He'd have made it work. Now, here's a principle that God operates under and is taught in 1 Corinthians 9. He doesn't distribute the same amount to everybody when it comes to that, like uh, earthly possessions where you make, where you minister to poor and so forth. He doesn't distribute the same amount to everybody. He distributes it so some people have too much and some people have too little. Then the ones that are too much, and this is taught, first, 2 Corinthians 9, those that have too much are to supply those who have too little. Yeah. And he tells them, and then the time will come when you won't have enough. Yeah, right. And then they'll supply you. Amen. That's how it works. Yeah. This is how God works. Amen. This is one way to assist the brethren in loving one another, see? <laughs> see the wisdom of God as it's distributed through his people. That's right. Because you don't just go around throwing money at everything. Mm -hmm. Or goods or food or whatever. Mm -hmm. You, with that comes an obligation to be wise in your stewardship mm -hmm. so that it actually works for the benefit. It, it doesn't help people to just throw stuff at them. They be, if, if it's not done with wisdom, anybody can become lazy and indolent and dependent and a, a server of men rather than serving right. God right. so that he says, this is where my bread is buttered, so I'm going to be nice to them. you got to see this is from God. God is the one that's giving. Yeah, yeah Jesus only fed people once. Twice, good, but twice. Now, we, we must see the parallel of this today, the, the crushing, the oppression of the poor and the crushing of the needy. Now, if these accounts are written for our, our admonition, as 1 Corinthians 10 11 says, and for our learning, as Romans 4, 15 4 would say, then there's a spiritual parallel Amen. to be seen here. Yeah. There are many people in churches that are spiritually poor and needy. Yes, that's right. They really do not have enough spiritual resources yeah. to navigate for one reason or another. And some of them, life has been has weighed them down. But sometimes when they go to church, they come away poorer than they were when they went. And they're crushed because maybe an obligation is laid on them like the Pharisees, and they didn't use a finger to lift it, remember, the weight. So they actually, religion can exaggerate legitimate hardship and need. And this should never happen in the body of Christ. Anytime anyone who's poor and needy in their spirits 
Jesus said, come to me, ye that are weary and heavy laden. He wasn't talking about finances or goods at that point. Come to me, I'll, I'll, give, you, I'll give you rest. Now that, that ministry has been handed over to the church. Amen. You do that. You, my people, you supply. Those, those that are weary and heavy laden with life, I expect them to come to you and you to give them rest. Oh, it's a great ministry. <laughs> Yes. To Peter about, he said, if you love me, feed my sheep. And so this is one, one way that we can express the love that we have for Christ is to care for his people. Amen. And also one of the things that I saw about this, it says, which say to their masters, bring and let us drink, is... The, it's like they're reversing the roles here. That's right, amen. They're saying to their That's masters, good. you bring me something to drink. Well, this is their master. They're to be serving them. So yeah, it's like they've, right, amen. they've lost amen. their willingness to serve. <laughs> it's a very pointed language, isn't it? Yes, mm -hmm. it's a verb. It's considering the scripture when it speaks of the form of godliness without the power thereof. Whenever, whenever there's a form that is that is spoken of to have power when it actually lacks power, that's when it becomes a robber. Mm -hmm. the Amen. Of God. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now to these people, the Lord has a word. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness that, lo, the days shall come upon you that he, he, God, will take you away with hooks and your posterity with fish hooks. Now I'm interested in this phrase sworn by his holiness. I find that to be an intriguing phrase. Some versions read, if take an oath by his holy name or promised by his holiness or by his holy character. As you should hear, the word holiness is not as easy a word to define as you may think. If you give it a little try. But the word literally means separateness. being separated or unique in character. He's sworn by his, and is an upright, his upright, righteous, holy character has moved him to say this. His anger didn't move him to say this. His character moved him to say this. Holiness, sacredness, separateness. See, God is separate from everything that's created. Yeah, amen. He is, at no point is God a peer. That's right, that's right. The psalmist spoke of the remembrance of his holiness. That's, that's good, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And the song of Moses, in that Gen Exodus 15, they sang about the he is glorious in holiness. Oh, that's good. And the psalmist spoke of the throne of his holiness. And apostolic writings affirm that God raised Jesus according to the spirit of holiness. See, so this is this divine trait is essential. God's holiness <coughs> speaks of his character as perfectly coordinated. Right. Who God is and what God says, perfectly coordinated. Who God is, what God does, perfectly coordinated. What, who God is, what he vows, perfectly coordinated. God never acts out of character, Amen. so to speak. Yeah. What has been done in Israel, what has been done by Israel is really repugnant to God. Yeah. Uh -huh. It is offensive to God. In a sense, it angers God because of his character. He can't abide such things. <coughs> now, men have a propensity of, to think about God as being kind of an ideal man. Yeah. It, that's kind of how they, how they think of him, being an ideal man. Possessing attributes like themselves or what they think is, uh, is best. Except it's in a fuller way. With them, there's inconsistent, but he's, he's perfect in the things that we should be. 
For the psalmist wrote, These things you have done, and I kept silent. You thought that I was altogether like you. But I will rebuke you and set them in order before your eyes. That's Psalm 50, verse 21. You thought I was like you. Huh. See, that's why you said, if God's God, why did he do that? Why, why did God do that? If he loves the world, see, they think God's like a man. And God said, I'm going to rebuke you for that. And I'm going to spell it out for you, just so you'll know. So God is affirming that he will now do what his nature dictates to be done. This isn't like done in a flash of anger like a man would. Just not a fit of rage, just explode. It's not that. Not that type of thing. <coughs> he's going to, he's been long suffering, but he's not going to be any, any longer. Eventually, God's righteousness and holiness will fully, will be fully expressed. He is, he is, he's going to come against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Eventually, that's going to happen. Occasionally, it happens now when his indignation erupts, as in the text before us. The God's, God's righteousness and holiness trumps his love. Now, God's love is great, but his righteousness is greater. God is love, I understand it, but God's not only love. And love is not his highest trait. Righteousness is his highest trait. His righteousness is why Jesus had to die. His righteousness is what dictated that kind of a salvation. I don't think a lot of people know this, but see, he's, he's telling them, I sworn in my holiness. That's what he's saying, see. Lo, the days come upon you. <coughs> low, the word low, low. That word means behold, look, see. Yes, but there, adjacent. Actually, in, in Scripture, if you count the number of times attributes are named, I don't have the numbers obviously off the top of my head, but yeah. holiness is mentioned more That's right. than any of the other attributes That's of right. God. And most, most thinkers of Christian thinkers have said that, in a sense, holiness is the sum total, sum total yeah. of all of God's attributes. So, mm -hmm. so when God is loving, He's still holy. holy. That is, yeah. God yeah. doesn't compromise His holiness yeah. or righteousness in order to love. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, that's Amen. Right. Now, now, people do. Mm -hmm. yeah. People will compromise to love certain things. Mm -hmm. In other words, people will love things they shouldn't love. They will, they will be immoral to love certain things, or they will compromise what they know is right mm -hmm. to love a person that, yeah. they, that they have affections for. Right. But God doesn't do this. Amen. Amen. Right. Amen. And, you're, and when, you start, when you start thinking in that direction, like you just mentioned, you get to the very heart of why Jesus died. That's right. That's right. Amen. This, Amen. Is the, this is at the very heart of... Yeah. Of the gospel. Amen. That God, because he could not compromise his integrity, yeah. that's why Jesus had to bear sin. Amen. Boy, right. oh, this is important stuff, Brother Jason. Yeah, the, the love of God, he, his character perfectly complements one another. All of his aspects of his character. His love moved him. First he creates creates man in his own image, mm -hmm. which would appeal to this love side to where he would be moved to, to do something on their behalf. And at the same time, right, just w w would tell him what the payment for that. What's the payment for you to, your son's got to die. Yeah. See, the, 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 I can see how they're, they perfectly complement one another. Yeah. I know that there's a sense in which <coughs> God's uh, sending of Christ is connected with his love. I mean, I, I understand that. But his righteousness is what made it necessary. That's right. That made it necessary. He loved within the framework of righteous righteousness. His love is in providing yes. a way for you not to be condemned. That's right. Amen. Right. That that's the love. That his his love is demonstrated yeah. in the provision mm -hmm. of, of of 
forgiveness. That's right. Mm -hmm. Right. But he, but he, did, he didn't love the angels that fell. Yeah. I mean, he, he, they, they're, here they are right in his presence. They fall. He doesn't say, I've got to save them. No. Yeah. There was something about man that moved him. Of course, God knew, knows yeah. exactly what he's doing. But, but, but unless God is moved to do something, how are you going to make God do something? Yeah. It, it's got to come within himself. It's got to mm -hmm. be within himself that he's moved to be compassionate. Yeah. Well, the, yeah. the person of Christ, that's the one and the, that's the one thing that allowed God to maintain his righteousness yeah. and yet save people. Yeah. You take Christ out of the picture and this is impossible. Yes. Necessary for it to be a righteous work, so that all that God is can be expressed yes, in salvation. Yes, yes, that's right. Amen. Amen. When you when you begin to see that too, it actually makes the love of God. Yeah. It 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 doesn't take away from the love of God. <laughs> it amplifies Amen. the love of God. Amen. When yeah. you see the holiness of God yeah. and the fact, see, God could have destroyed man. God is not under any obligation, as Brother Robert was saying with the example of the angels. Mm -hmm. yes. Nothing places God under an obligation to be loving and merciful. Mm -hmm. So if if God had said, well, I'm just going to wipe them out, like he almost did with the flood. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. Amen. But, mm -hmm. So let's say, what if God had just wiped humanity out? Well, God, God would have been perfectly within his rights. Mm -hmm. And he would have been perfectly right to have done that. Mm -hmm. But he he freely chose not to. Yes. Mm -hmm. Amen. To, sa to save man. So this, mm -hmm. people today, they they think there's like a contradiction here. But, but actually, they're making God less loving, not more loving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If, you re if you reject this, the, if, if mm -hmm. people will do that. They'll just reject the whole idea of atonement. This is very popular in the in, in the like the academic and theological world. There are people that just the idea of atonement they just reject it outright. Mm -hmm. yes. But in doing so, yeah. and they think they're amplifying the love. They're actually cheapening the yeah. love of God. The love of God doesn't mean anything. Yeah. <laughs> if if He's just loving us because we're just nice people or or something like that, it make it it lessens the love of God. Amen. Yeah, you mentioned this matter of atonement. There presently a, a fellow author, uh, which I'll not name, but he's been around a long time. He had embraced the annihilationist theory. And he said he did it because it enabled him to present a more merciful God, that eventually the damned will be burned up. Now he is addressing the atonement. And he has come into a society of people who have read these old writers who question the atonement. Said that some say he said that he erroneously believed that God was angry, and Jesus stepped in and absorbed the shock of God's anger in order that he might save man. And this, and so he's questioning this. He's and he's as global global Christian influence among conservative Christian people and because he said this they're buying it up yeah. hook line and sinker never thought I'd live to see something like this but this is this is happening among the ultra conservative Christian world the atonement is being questioned yeah. Lo, the days come upon you that is, you can't stop this. They're going to, in a sense, it's like the second coming of Christ. Suddenly, the whole see your whole situation is going to be all changed suddenly, altered suddenly. I'm going to bring judgment upon you. You'll be taken away with hooks. <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of harsh language. Just like, just like men will become like fish that are just hooked and taken out of the sea. Other versions read you'll be with fish hooks or meat hooks. They'll drag you away with ropes, one version says. And the idea is that God will force his will upon you. He'll force it on you. You will have to leave the city. You will have no choice at all in the matter. They'll hook you and drag you out. Boy, that's strong language. 
They'll be carried away like a fisherman hooks a fish and takes it away, or like a person in a, with a big basket of meat has a meat hook and reaches in there and just takes hooks a piece and takes it out. God says, I'm gonna, you're going to leave the city. You don't have any, you don't have any choice. I'm going to take you out of that city. You provoke me too long. See? Let's bring it up to date. You're not going to be a church anymore. I'm going to take away your candlestick. You aren't going to have any godly influence. You aren't going to have any influence with me. You're not going to be in my favor. There will not be a thing you can do about it. Maybe in such a state it's impossible to renew you to repentance. The, the objective of life is to stay out of that category. Stay out of that category where God makes pledges like this because he's going he's gonna to carry it out. Speaking through Ezekiel, God spoke in a similar manner. Ezekiel 29, 4. I will put hooks in thy jaws, and I will cause the fish of thy rivers to stick into thy scales, and I will bring thee up out of the midst of thy rivers, and all the fish of thy rivers shall stick to thy scales. So I'm going to take you and everything you've accumulated, everything round about you, and I'm going to just take you out. Yeah. I'll put a hook in your jaw, and I'll just take you out of activity. Yeah. <laughs> he would uproot them from the land, as Jeremiah 2.7 says. That's what he's speaking about. I'm taking you out of the land. I put you in, I'm taking you out. Again, speaking through Jeremiah, God said, if they will not obey, I will utterly pluck up and destroy that nation, saith the Lord. Pluck it up. Finally, the word of the Lord, the Lord told Jeremiah to say to Baruch, who's the one that wrote Jeremiah's writings in the book, Thou didst say, Woe is me now, for the Lord hath added grief to my sorrow. I fainted in my sign, and I find no rest. Thus shalt thou say to him, The Lord saith thus, Behold that which I have built, that which I have built will I break down. And that which I have planted I will pluck up. Even this whole land. That's God said that. This is what God said. I planted it. I'm pulling it up. In the time of the kings, 2 Chronicles 7, 19 says, Then will I pluck them up by the roots out of my land which I have given them, and this house which I have sanctified for my name will I cast out of my sight and will make it to be a proverb and a byword among the nations. He's talking about the same thing Amos is talking about. And I'll take away your prosperity. He will take away, take your prosperity away. In other words, and say posterity, not prosperity. Pros posterity. I will take your posterity away. Other versions read the residue or the last of you. There will be, be none left, in other words. Yeah. I'm going to empty the land altogether. Your children, every last one of you. The idea is that the land will be emptied. In other words, the fatness of a hypocritical Israel would not be able to impart one ounce of strength. All that they had accumulated would not be able to give them any advantage. When God began doing this, they'd have no way to resist it. No way to counter it. They'd be absolutely powerless to do anything about it. Now, do you believe that a person can actually reach that state that when God begins to take their candlestick away or tear down their spiritual house, so to speak, there isn't anything they can do about it? Oh, yeah. It's possible to get in that state. And listen, brother, one of the purposes of a body of believers is to help ensure that doesn't happen. Amen. And churches that are inclined to meet few times and all this sort of thing, they increase the possibility of this state happening. Because God, Jesus has built a church that has an inner edification. Edification is built into the fabric of the church itself. Yes. The house can tear it down. Tear it down. It makes perfectly sound reasoning. This equates to Jesus taking the candlestick away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You get this image of 
Israel having dammed up a pool of opulence and they're swimming around in this That's pool. Right. That's right. And they're they're gluttonous in there and God's going to use their prosperity mm -hmm. as the bait on the hook. Mm -hmm. That's good. The very thing that they're giving themselves oh, to is going to be good. their undoing. That's yeah. good. Amen. <laughs> and ye shall go out at the breaches to the broken walls. Breaches are the parts of the walls broken down. The walls around the city and they busted the wall down. There's gaping holes in the wall. You go through the broken walls, or through the breaches in the walls, or through the breaks of the walls, gaps in the wall. God will take away the means of protection. That wall was a means of protection. He'll make them vulnerable. He'll make them vulnerable. And God will take away the means of protection. They then will be taken out through these gaping holes in the wall. This, you might think that they would escape through the holes. That's not what he's saying. He said that you'll be drug out through these holes. The destruction would not take place in one part of the city, every part of the city. No matter where you were, there'd be a hole in the wall. Protection taken away. Enemy available to drag you right out through there. It's possible, as some suggest, that the people would hasten the escape through the gaping holes, but if they did, then the enemy would be waiting for them and catch them. Ye shall cast them into the palace. In other words, and say into Harmon, you'll cast them into Harmon, fling them into Harmon. Harmon, the word Harmon, is a transliteration of the Hebrew word Harmon, which is here translated palace. Actually, the idea is it isn't a luxurious palace. It's the idea of a broken down palace that becomes a garbage dump. That's the idea. The, the palace, the palaces that they built will be nothing more than a heaps of ruin. And so they'll, you'll be drug out through the gaping holes in the wall and thrown on the trash heap. This is God said this, his yeah. own people, throw them on a trash heap of humanity as worthless goods. The point, again, is that all those who've been living in luxury at the expense of the oppression of the poor and the needy, fattening their own coffers by robbing from the people, I'm going to show how worthless they really are. I'm going to put a hook in their jaw. I'm going to, I'm going to pull them out of activity. The enemy is going to come in, drag them out, and they won't, won't be like, this isn't going to be spread over a long period of time. They'll take them out through these gaping holes in the wall, and they'll just be good for nothing. Yeah. They'll be captives, and they'll be good, just good for nothing. And to this day, Israel, mm -hmm. the ten tribes, to this day, have never recovered from this. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Now, the prophets say they will. God will gather them, but see, to this day, we're several thousand years now. Past this, they never recovered. They became a trash heap and a byword to the world. Now, <laughs> a similar thing has happened in our day that I'm compelled to mention. The modern church has done with the gospel what the Jews did with the law. They've customized it to fit their own liking. That's what Jews did. They took the law and they snipped off this and pasted in that and they tailored it to fit their needs. That's what the modern church has done to the gospel. It's not really what they're presenting. It's really not the gospel. It's their own fabricated gospel. It's another, another gospel. And all this has been done under the auspices of Satan. He's directed this. He's the father of all lies. So if it's a lie, Satan's the one that authored it. Because God's name is jealous, he cannot long tolerate the existence of competitive gods and competitive gospels. There comes a time he can't 
endure this anymore. Those who have attempted to get away from all this corruption have sometimes fallen into worse corruptions, trying to escape erroneous religion. They actually ended up on a trash heap themselves because they didn't flee to God. See, it's one thing to f get away from what's not right. It's another thing to get to God. As to that's phase two. <laughs> one thing to get out of Egypt, but getting into Canaan, that's the, that's the point. <laughs> now, none of this should take us by surprise. When you consider the staggering investment that God has made in the salvation of men, all this, all the years, 4,000 years it took to prepare for the coming of Christ, all the demonstrations of his character that took place in those times. Then when Jesus came, the laying of the sins of the world upon him, delivering them over to ungodly men to do with what they want, giving Satan and the powers of darkness power for an hour, so to speak, to do whatever what they want. To think of that staggering investment and how God's own heart must have been broken as he had to turn his face from his son. Yeah. How the son cried out, asked the Lord if there's any other way. If there's any other way, but there wasn't any other way. Yeah. Now after an investment of that sort, to have a lukewarm church, I'm sorry, this is unacceptable. Amen. To have a disinterested and uninformed people, Amen. this is unacceptable. Right. Does it make any difference who seeks to alibi for it? It's unacceptable. Oh, yeah. If Israel's condition is unacceptable, see, a greater investment has been put in, uh, into yeah. this salvation. So with, uh, this situation we've just read about, we don't want to have any fat cows among us. Amen. You remember those fat cows that, he, that Joseph saw in his dream? <laughs> Some lean cows ate them up. Remember that? Uh -huh. That's what happened here. Yeah. Some lean heathen cows uh -huh. ate up these fat cows of Israel. That's what happened. That's how God worked. Mm -hmm. And in inferior people will be the undoing of Christians who have become sloven in their lives. Yeah. Ungodly people will undo them. That's God's matter. Well, as uh, I close there, there's a lot in that text. See, this is the kind of ministry Amos had. When he got up in the morning, this is the kind of stuff he talked about. Got a chance to speak. This is, he didn't have a gospel, see. So, uh, if Amos could be faithful to deliver this word, how faithful must we be in delivering a good, the word of the good gospel, the good news of the gospel? Any of you have a word you'd like to say before we close? Yes, Brother Jason? Yeah, just along those lines that these, exam these examples are, are, are in Scripture so that when, when believers read the book of Amos, this should this should drive you back to the gospel, Amen. Mm -hmm. That's so, right. so that so that you won't so that you won't fall into this state. Mm -hmm. you, nobody has to nobody has to have God speak to them this way. This I mean this there's provision in the gospel that you never end up in this condition. Amen. Mm -hmm. oh, and so a word like this. Should, should drive believers to the gospel. But you, you're exactly right. Amos didn't have a gospel. Not, mm. not in the, at least not in the fullness. He might have had some hints about it. But the, this is a new day. Amen. And, so, and there's, a, there's a sense in which, too, that God would never speak, God would never speak this way to, to, to like real believers. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So I mean, Amen. A, a believer doesn't have to worry about being called a fat cow. That's Amen. You know, the only people who are called that are backsliders yeah. or mm -hmm. people who are pretending. Mm -hmm. Who are what, what we call hypocrites. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So you just make so you just make sure you go back to the gospel, you examine yourself, you make sure you're in the faith, see? You don't have to worry. You don't have to fear that this will be your condition. Amen. Yes, Anna? Um, if we begin to hear God's Word, we will want to listen to God's Word. But if we don't listen to God's Word, we won't want to hear God's Word, and we will become deaf. That's right. Amen. Amen. All right, we'll have a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word of Amos. We thank you for he was a faithful prophet serving his generation as David served his. We want, Lord, after hearing these prophecies, we want, do not want to be classified as that kind of people. We want to be among those who fear God and walk in his ways, hate iniquity, love the truth, and we know, Lord, there's grace to do this. So we're asking for grace to pursue with a relentless zeal to be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>